Thank you. All right. Good morning, and welcome to this week's edition of Encompass Live. I am your host, Krista Porter, here at the Nebraska Library Commission. Uh, Encompass Live is the Commission's weekly online event. We're a webinar, a webcast, online show. Um, the terminology is up for debate. Um, but whatever you call us, we are here live online every Wednesday morning at 10 a.m. Central Time. Um, if you're unable to join us on Wednesday mornings, that's fine. We do record the show every week, and the um, recordings are then posted onto our website. And I'll show you at the end of today's show where to go and see all of those recordings. Um, we have recorded the show up there, um, any presentations, so we'll have a link to this. So if you want to look at the slides later, um, you should do that. Um, anything you need will be there afterwards in the recordings. Uh, both of the live show and the recordings are free and open to anyone to watch. So if you know of anyone, um, colleagues, friends, neighbors, family, anybody who might be interested in any of our topics that we were doing, um, please do send them to our website. Have them, they can watch our recordings or they can register and watch any of our upcoming shows. Uh, we do a mixture of things here on Encompass Live, uh, interviews, book reviews, uh, mini training sessions, demos of services and products. Uh, really the only criteria we have is it's something library related, um, something libraries are doing, not something they should be doing, I think. Um, new products and services we think they might be interested in, um, programs and things we're doing here at the Library Commission. It's all over the board, um, and any types of libraries. We have things for public libraries, academic, special, museums. We've had everything run the gamut on the show here. Like I said, our really your only criteria is libraries. Um, we do have Nebraska Library Commission staff that come on the show, um, usually representing things that are service programs or things we're doing here for the commission. But we also bring in guest speakers, and that's what we have this morning um, from our Nebraska Library Association's Intellectual Freedom. Um, Round table, yeah. round table. <laughs> um, we have uh, Michael Ellenzer and Todd Shelby and <laughs> at the end, Tim Lentz there at the end. Um, and they're going to talk about the new um, manual they put together. There was an old one that was, I assume, used by some people out there. There is yeah. an old one. Okay, there was an old one. <laughs> it's a completely revamped these way. So I'm just going to hand it over to you guys to um, talk about it and what's going on with the Thank you. Thank you for the invite too for yeah. having us on here as well. Yes. We appreciate it. And yeah, I'm, uh, yeah, I'm Michael Elster. I'm the uh, chair of the Intellectual Freedom Roundtable for a few short months later until Tim Lenz takes over. But um, but really, we kind of want to talk about what we've worked on all through the last year or year and a half, um, which was coming up with a new manual because our old manual was pretty old. We just needed knew that we had to um, create a new one uh, based on a lot of different factors. So um, another thing I always want to say, anyone that's watching out there that's you know, live watching, if anyone wants to join, please go to the NLA website and join the Intellectual Freedom. We, we always are looking for new members. We seem a little under, we have a lot of members. We're, we're growing, which is good, but we, it's such an important topic and we really want a lot of people to understand a lot of the concepts and, and work with us. So, um, so now really what we're going to talk about is kind of the new annual and the process and how we made it. Um, so, why did we need a new manual? Well, the, the last update of our manual was 2004, and you know that's pretty much before Facebook was even around then, right? Nothing. So the whole world was kind of a yeah. different environment back then. Um, and in 2004, you know, so the manual was about two pages long. Um, it didn't really address many issues, and and it was just kind of time for an update. So the team. You know, we talked about whether we're going to edit it or create a new one, and we really decided we need a brand new manual. So we scratched that one, um, and we made a new manual. It's available digitally for free. Uh, you can purchase it for like about six dollars, I think, through Zia Books, um, through the UNL Press. And so we really want a lot of libraries to order this and use it as an everyday manual. Um, so how we created it, uh, ALA actually updated their manual in 2015, and that was kind of our jump, you know, jump off point to say, oh, we should probably update our, our old guy and make sure that we have, <laughs> have our things up to, up to code. Um, so we worked with ALA and Todd uh, ordered a, a manual for himself and they, they were really generous in saying, you can use this guy. They, they were kind of like, you can use the guy, um, use all the parts of the guy, just don't copy it you know, verbatim and use it exactly. 
So we based a lot of it on. They probably have not even really buy theirs if you're just going to copy it. Might as well just <laughs> use theirs instead of, yeah. Yeah, I just kind of run it through and copy it. Put NLA on the top and good. So, they, so yeah, they were really generous with what we could use. and um, But we, we definitely wanted to make it unique to Nebraska and make it based on what's going on here in Nebraska. So we, we revamped it quite a bit. And it's a lot shorter than it. There's about 200 pages, I think, or something. So. Um, so yeah, we just want this to serve as a guide to uh, for librarians all across the state to be used um, daily when issues come up. Um, so the way we did it, we kind of each took a section from the Intellectual Freedom Manual from ALA, and we uh, revised it, read through it, um, recreated it, and wrote. And then we, uh, and a lot of times when you're working as a team like that, there's a lot of overlap in different chapters. So we had a couple of editors get together and really revamp it and kind of streamline it and and that's kind of the product that we have. And I'll hold it up, they can kind of see it. So this is yeah. what it looks like in print copy, the NLA. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, that you can order. And you can also download it for free. So if you just want to read through it and make sure you know, that the $6 is going to good use, feel free. Um, so, and I'm going to kind of talk about the Office of Intellectual Freedom uh, through the ALA. So it was established in 1967. And it's um, charged with implementing the ALL policies uh, concerning the concept of intellectual freedom. Um, and really, the responsibilities are, are to educate librarians and the general public about the nature and importance of intellectual freedom in libraries and support librarians, teachers, and administrators who are undergoing a material service challenge. So a service challenge would be um, if someone wants to ban a book, if someone wants to remove material. And we really support that. That's one of the main things we do. And, um, so, you know, so if you have a, if you do have a challenge or policy or uh, uh, someone's challenging a book or wanting to ban a book, contact us because we really want to know about that. Um, it's one of our important things that we do. So, uh, so, um, yeah, that's interesting. So, yeah, so, yeah, we, we, we're censoring our own material. Try that again. Oh, there we go. Okay. So what we do, yeah, we do more than the despite the censorship and getting rid of uh, books and banned books. Um, and it addresses really fundamental rights for patrons, like access to resources and making sure that the library is really re representing the community and ordering books that appeal to everybody, not just um, who the library and things they appeal to. Um, filtering software um, can really block searches and can be a form of censorship. A lot of times they'll block searches, maybe medical searches that people are looking for. And, um, yeah, and it's not very well done sometimes. Um, and privacy, people really need the privacy to look up information without being judged or, or thinking people are looking over their shoulder. Um, meeting rooms, uh, or well, copyright issues um, is kind of an intellectual freedom thing, you know, making sure you're not stealing people's ideas. Uh, meeting room usage, are they being neutral? Are you letting anybody use it? Um, minors' rights, if minors have the same rights, uh, and we are not to there to parent the minors. We're there to um, provide access to information. So, uh, labeling materials, and Todd's going to talk a lot about labeling materials. But that can be a form of restriction and censorship, also. And free speech is really, you know, one of the things that has to be defended. And it's really ugly and can be disgusting, but we um, we really want to defend free speech. Um, so, responsibilities of librarians. And I'll kind of read this quote because I like it. Um, that librarians significantly influence or control the selection, organization, preservation, and dissemination of information. And in a political system grounded in an informed citizenry, we are members of a profession explicitly committed to intellectual freedom and the freedom of access to information. And we have a special mm -hmm. obligation to ensure the free flow of information and ideas to present and future generations. Mm -hmm. So I think that really comes to what we do. Um, you know, this is, uh, we, we have a lot of power in what we get for uh, for our patrons to look at, right? We, we kind of decide what kind of information they can see. And um, it's even becoming different in this new era of post-facts and alternative facts where uh, a lot of things can be, um, you know, even anti-science can be kind of put on the shelf. And we have to really decide how we, as librarians, are committed to making sure that we are not censoring any information, but at the same time, we need to make sure that we are um, not just putting it all out there as if everything was on equal footing. So that can be kind of a difficult challenge of censorship versus informed. Informed, informed. yeah. Uh, What's going, what is going on out there, yeah. 
So when there's someone who's discredited, like a Dr. Oz, there's a medical issue, do you really want to put that on the shelf right next to your medical things? I mean, there's a lot of choices in there. So, um, yeah, so and you can't really have like a discredited viewpoint shelf, right? Like you don't like these, <laughs> so we're gonna put them on this one shelf. You have to figure out how to really do that accounting. So yeah, so it's kind of how do we uh, help patrons distinguish between good and bad information about censorship and not just be a search engine like Google where we're just throwing information at them and making them decide because that that can uh, that can lead to some problems as well. So we do want different viewpoints, but having them based in some sort of fact is an important aspect also. So um, I think with that, I think with that, I'm going to turn it over to Todd. Okay. Um, I really like that quote that Michael put up there because it shows just how committed my brains are uh, to intellectual freedom. That's right there in the introduction to the Code of Ethics. Um, and we're going to look just very quickly at the basis for that commit. Why are we so committed uh, there? Um, for one, it comes from the Constitution. The First Amendment, right there, you have um, the freedom of expression, the freedom of the press, and then this seems really obvious, um, if you've got those two things going on, you have to have the freedom to access that information. Um, it hasn't always been obvious to everyone, so the Supreme Court did at one point rule, yes, uh, this is a necessary corollary to the First Amendment, to the freedom to expression, freedom of the press. You have the freedom to access information. So that's one of the reasons why librarians are very committed to that. It's right there in the Constitution. Um, and then to help that process of accessing information, to not be judged for what you're accessing, we have the right to privacy. Um, now in the context of the Constitution, we have the right to privacy unless law enforcement or the government has a reasonable suspicion, probable cause, to believe that we've committed some sort of crime. So privacy, unless there's a reasonable suspicion that you've committed a crime. Uh, so that's, that's really pretty, I mean, gives us um, a lot of room and a lot of things that we can do to keep um, people's um, freedom to access information uh, out of, you know, for them, for them to uh, conduct it in, in a safe environment. Nebraska law also strengthens that for public institutions, especially public libraries, it gives public libraries um, the right to withhold all, any kind of record that would reveal the identity of a library patron. So this might be um, a circulation uh, records. This might be something that's in, you know, simply the information that you've got in on file about a library patron. You don't have to reveal any of that. If you have computer sign-up sheets where people sign in, it's probably a good idea to shred those at the end of the, end of the day because, again, those are identifying pieces of information. Take the count from that computer sheet to get rid of it, um, computer sign-up sheet. Um, so, I mean, and there's that idea, in order to protect privacy, you keep as few records as possible. And generally speaking, also, the, um, you know, our, I come from Southeast Library System, the Nebraska the Library Association, I believe also the Nebraska the Library Commission would also extend this to things like videos in libraries. Under Nebraska law, uh, those, those need to be subpoenaed or there needs to be a warrant in order, order for those to be turned over. And we, the ALA has really helped us in the process of developing our professional, I guess, attitude towards intellectual freedom. It's really embedded in the Code of Ethics, the Library Bill of Rights, and the Freedom to Read statement. So that freedom to access information and privacy is just all over in these documents, and so we've included them in the Nebraska Library Association's Intellectual Freedom Manual. Um, and they're really good documents to read, and there's more. I mean, that's certainly not all of them. There's interpretations of the Library Bill of Rights there, and there's other documents as well. So that freedom to access information, let's talk about access for just a little bit here. I'm going to try to keep it to just a little bit. <laughs> so far it's not been a little bit when we've done this in other places. Um, okay. 
accessing information is traditionally meant for libraries accessing the collection that the library has. And today that's both print and digital. Obviously, when somebody comes into the library and says, you know, I, I'd really like to read this book and you don't have it, you want to either order it or enter a library, you want to find a way for it to get into their hands. You also want to consider, okay, what does the community need? Is there, you know, a Spanish speaking element in the community that's not using the library because it doesn't know either that, you know, there's Spanish speaking things that can be gotten there or because you haven't ordered them. Um, so those kinds of things need to be considered. We also want to go beyond just simply what the community wants and needs to be on what we can see because a library again is a place to access information and to expand your mind. So we want a pretty good amount of diversity in our collection. Um, in many numerous communities, um, children and adults uh, don't get many opportunities to even travel outside of the state. Mm -hmm. So the library can be a place for them to grow, to find out what other cultures think, um, how um, they, what other what uh, kinds of viewpoints exist in other parts of the world. Uh, so we. We want to have that sort of thing in the collection. We want to have a few opposing viewpoints in the collection. Michael's already spoken to that a little bit, that that can be a bit of a tricky thing. Uh, and we want to make sure there's something for everybody in the community. And we may have to do some research sometimes on this. You want to look at your demographics. You want to just be aware of some of the facts that are out there, for example. Um, if you've got 300 people in your community, you have to be, you just you're going to know that there's three people with bipolar disorder or three and and three people with schizophrenia just statistically plus there will be people with depression and anxiety and you've got their friends and family members so you want to have a collection on mental illness and those books generally will get checked out um, so just an example um, those people you may not you oftentimes will not be able to tell at all that they have a mental illness but that doesn't mean that they aren't there in the community and that there's not a fair number of them there. Um, it's important as librarians that we resist censorship in every way that we can. So oftentimes we have an opportunity to engage in education. This is often really informal uh, because somebody will come into the library and say, you know, is this really appropriate for the library? Is this DVD? I, um, so, when somebody is coming in like that, you know, you can say, I, I can see your point of view, I, you know, and maybe even agree with it. Um, and you, I think it's okay to say that in that case. Um, at the same time, then you say, it's fine for, you know, you to know or to feel that this is not appropriate for you or for your household, but we have households and people in this community for who believe that it's appropriate for them and we have to serve everybody. Uh, so it, there's a lot of opportunities for education when uh, we're facing possible, when we face people who would like this to engage in censorship. Um, this is something that needs to be done with library boards and possibly college administration sometimes. Um, things like that. And there certainly needs to be policy and procedures in place in case somebody wants to go beyond that informal conversation and actually try to make the move to remove an item uh, so that there is a coherent means of doing that and that they um, have the opportunity to express their wishes and that that will be handled um, in a good way. Um, there's other ways of uh, of having censorship take place in a library. People may realize through their conversations with librarians or neighbors or whatever, they may realize that the library really isn't going to simply remove items easily. So it may be easier to just put an item somewhere in the library where it's going to be hidden for a long time um, or walk out the door with that item. Uh, so I think it's good for librarians to kind of have their eye on items that might potentially be controversial, and if they do go missing, to be very ready to replace them. Um, I know Jamie Rulu at the Office for Intellectual Freedom said that, you know, when you as library director, you know, if something went missing, be 
order multiple copies of that <laughs> item and you know send the message. Okay, we're gonna. This item is here okay. and it's here to stay. Okay. I just saw something online this group that I'm in some library talking about. Someone had checked out everything on a certain topic. Yeah. And then just didn't return it. And didn't yes. care that they were going to have a problem with site fees. With they're just like, I yeah. make sure you yeah. go to the library and never this to so I'm just going to take them off. Yeah, yeah. And, and that's now exactly. you're, you have none of those on whatever that topic is. And like, how do I do this? And you do that. You, you buy it again. You buy them again. Yep, exactly. And hopefully your budget can take that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, agency. Build yeah, it into your budget. Idea. Yeah, build it into your budget a little bit. You do have to have that built in, yes. I just think we're going to go missing. On purpose or by accident. Or, or accident. There are there are plenty of things that don't get uh, returned, or you know, depending on your community and so on. Okay, I'm going to talk a little bit about labeling because this can be a way of exercising censorship. We usually think of labeling as things like genre stickers on books, um, and we think of those usually as something that is helpful as a finding aid, and at the same time they can be prejudicial, and so that. LA has, you know, kind of put out the warning that um, a labeling a book um, in a prejudicial way is a form of censorship. And when you think about it, you know, for some people, if they see even something like a mystery label on a book, they're going to go, oh, that book's not for me, um, and not take a second glance at it. And where if, whereas if they read the description of the book, they might actually be drawn in and think, oh, this is really interesting. And you know, just because it's labeled a mystery doesn't mean that it, it's not a book for them. Uh, so labels, labels, while they can be a finding aid, they can also be prejudicial. Um, and then there's a couple more specific examples that I have. Um, the different drape, and the issue going on with this book is that you have um, two moms and a boy. So there are some people um, who are going to find uh, this book objectionable just because of that fact. Um, so, you know, what would you do if somebody came up and said, you know, I think this book should be labeled um, in some way. Put a genre label on it or put a label on it that says, you know, this may not be appropriate for all households. Well, again, that, that sort of thing is um, prejudicial. You certainly want to avoid that so that you're not you know, back warning people off the book. That is, that is censorship. Um, the next that goes back to yeah. we're not the parent. Yes. It's not up to us to make the judgment call that this is inappropriate for some people. It's up to you as a parent to look at the book first before your child gets their hands on it and decide, yeah. oh, this is cool. Dragons are awesome. Here, read it. Or, oh, no. Yeah. And it, not, not let your child. And that's up to you, not us to let And that it goes let, yeah. for anything that children are checking out. You know, the library is not plain parent. It's the conversation needs to happen between the parent or the guardian and the child about what the parent and guardian believes is appropriate for their children at this stage in their life to be checking out. That's not something that we can decide. It's going to be, frankly, in the same household, often different for different children. Um, and different households are going to be in different places on these things. Um, so what may be appropriate in one household, another, what may be one household may judge appropriate, another household is going to regard totally differently. Uh, and we just need to keep ourselves out of that whole conversation and let this conversation take place where it needs to happen. Um, now, the next item really has almost a little bit to do with diversity. This is an example of Christian fiction. And I do know that this, this can act in a prejudicial way. There are people who see the label on their Christian fiction and just go, oh, yeah, I'm not going to read it. Um, you know, it's going to be too much about morality, too much about not liars. Whatever experience they've had with it, they're going to be going, uh, yeah. And, um, and whereas for other people, it's a finder's aid, and they they ask for you know those specific class where the Christian fiction is, and if there's labels on it, um, it helps them uh, find those books. Um, one thing to be careful of here is that well, the libraries I've worked can simply haven't labeled it. You know, you can find it in the catalog by searching Christian fiction, and then it That's pops awesome. up. Yeah, I agree. With all of the yeah. subject headings and things you can always look up whatever you want yeah. there, rather than having it all. Like here's a big sign where you want me. It's the way things like bookstores are labeled. Yeah, that's where they're at. But 
libraries. Yeah. And what the thing that we can be problematic here is that we want to be serving the entire community. And there will be Christians in a community who don't particularly care for Christian fiction or for most Christian fiction. Mm -hmm. Christian fiction does come in some different forms and flavors. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it just depends a little bit. But we have to realize even within the Christian community, there's differences mm -hmm. um, on that. And then what do you do about the people in the community who um, silently or openly are not Christian? Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, they may tend towards Buddhism, they may be agnostic. They, may have a totally different belief system. Uh, so what message are you sending to those folks when you have books labeled Christian fiction, but you don't have books labeled? Every labeled single other religion. Yeah, yeah. yeah. labeled yeah. with every You're crazy you, if you start to. You, you're playing, in a way, you <laughs> are playing favoritism. Yeah. So, yes. Um, so, you know, are you, are you sending the message that you're censoring the other religions? And so that has a problematic side to it, as uh, well as being a finder's aid. Now the next item is, again, that example that Krista mentioned, where the library really wants to keep itself out of the discussion that should be going on with parent and child. This is an example of an R-rated DVD. So, you know, should a library check this out to children and teens? Well, that's really up to the parent or the guardian. And so it, the librarian isn't the person who should be making that decision. There, there are some libraries I know, I, I don't know it was, but this solved that issue with the movies at least, which do have ratings, which are designated not by us. Yeah, by they have no legal. Right. You know, there are some libraries I know that where they, um, there are there libraries are forms that they fill out that say, you know, if you want to, as a parent, you can say that your child's not allowed to check out our, our rated books, and we can double check that when they're doing the checkout. And there, you, you, bet, you, you can't be here with them every time they're checking out something, but you can say, for my child, don't let them do anything that's above, you know, that's R rated or, um, or not. And then if that's built into that child's patron record or somehow, is that a way of working around that? Because the parent is done their parenting, but they're not there holding it with them every single time. And the libraries then, on a case by case basis, basis following instructions from the parents and saying, you gotta talk to your mom and your guardian about this first. Where that's still, I, I know I've heard a lot of to make it easier on everyone. Yeah. Just tell us if your child can, here's a form, but they are not allowed to still check out so that when they do go in, we can follow your instructions. And this is something too where this is the ideal. We don't get involved um, mm -hmm. at all if we can help it because, again, the parents really need to be on that. The guardians need to be. Parents and guardians need to be having those discussions with their children, right. and, and we're we're not helping at all by getting involved. Now, you will have community situations that arise, and you, you know, so sometimes libraries will have be faced with making decisions: Do I risk funding for the library, or do I make some accommodation here that parents, yeah, that so particularly local citizens, for example, will find acceptable? And you, you may have to kind of roll with the punches there and make a little bit of compromise just because of the community situation. And mm -hmm. you know, you don't really want to risk that the library gets a bad name or that so mm -hmm. it loses funding. So it's not, not always black and white. It's not, yeah, yeah, it's not a hard fast relationship. It's such a slippery slope. Do you start yeah. doing child by child, but what if that uh, child goes and self checks out something they're not supposed to, right. and they come back and they're like, We told you we couldn't have that. So, I think, yeah, just, well, just like every child in the world, they did something they told them not to, right? <laughs> I mean, that's, right. that's, that's kids' and parents, that's yeah. how it works. You yeah, so, them that parents. so, logistically, yeah. uh, there's a real question of how a library or most libraries could handle that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. can the technology even do that? Is there a way to block a person in, in, in the, in the, in the I'm like, yeah, I'm on my circulation system. I'll be even checking out something. Yeah, I mean, there's such a wide variety of circulation yeah. systems out there, or ILSs out there. Mm -hmm. A little bit about internet access. Almost all public libraries, at least, so provide computers so that people can access information over the internet. Uh, Mike's talked a little bit about this already, so I'll just mention quickly filtering prevents access. So you've got that in place, be cognizant of that. Also be cognizant of the fact that pornography is not illegal. Uh, sometimes there's that um, um, 
sometimes people will have the feeling that it is or should be, but it is not actually illegal. That is something that's protected under the First Amendment. Also, the courts have ruled that adults must have access to unfiltered computers. So you can't, if you do have your computers filtered, they can't all be filtered, or you have to be able to really quickly get to one of them unfiltered so that an adult at least can have access to unfiltered content. Now on the flip side of that coin, there are illegal activities that can happen on computers such as viewing um, child pornography. And if a librarian were to see that taking place, well, you wouldn't. You that yourself is. would not get involved, but you'd call the police. Mm -hmm. um, or if a patron alleges that, it's, it's the same thing. You just don't get involved. You let the police know, and they decide how to investigate, whether to investigate, etc. Um, it's it's that's something that's that's outside of our realm. Then. Mm -hmm. okay. And then finally, access to meeting rooms. Um, many libraries do have an area that they offer to the public, um, and the courts have gotten fairly involved here, so some of this language comes from, is based on what the courts have said. Um, meeting room rules have to be content neutral, they have to be applied equally to all groups, and they have to be really narrowly defined in regard to time, place, or manner of use. And here is what that concretely means in some examples. So if you're open to, if the meeting room is open to public use, religious services must be allowed. It used to be that many public libraries interpreted the establishment clause of the First Amendment to mean that they should not allow religious services in their meeting rooms. The courts have ruled otherwise, especially the lower courts. Uh, the Supreme Court hasn't specifically said that, but what the courts have said is that, you know, librarians can't even, aren't even in a position to judge what is actually a religious service. Um, so to prevent government entanglement with religion, religious services must be allowed in a publicly an institution that's opening its medium to public use. Now a library can do other things that help protect its mission. It can limit frequency of group meetings. Again, this has to apply to all groups, so you could say a group can meet a maximum once a month or use a meeting room once a month so that other groups have a chance to be in there. You can regulate the noise level so that it doesn't interfere with other library activities. And you can disallow the collection of money. Um, libraries, again, uh, connecting to their mission can restrict nonprofit groups or they may charge, choose to charge commercial groups a fee. And all of this is not necessarily what you have to do. This is going to be the thing you can These do. are the things that it's, you decide what you can yeah, do. Yeah. Like you might allow a, well, if you have a book signing, an author comes in, mm -hmm. you'll probably let them sell their book to people who come to the library potentially. It's not the library collecting the funds or anything like that, but that means it's not like you can't do these things. It's just these are things you're going to want to know. What are your policies? What, yeah, and what, what do you have room for in your policies? Um, so you, you don't have to allow um, even authors to collect a percentage um, of their book sales, but it might be in your interest to do so just to get the authors there. Um, and sometimes um, then a percentage of the book sale can also be donated to something like the Friends of the Library, oh, yeah. something like that. Like uh, but you do have to really, in the formulation of the policy that governs the medium, you're going to have to make sure that it is fair. Whatever you're doing is mm -hmm. fair. So if you're allowing somebody like authors to basically collect money, you're going to probably have to allow some other folks to do it. You're going to want to think about how. You know, or you're going to need a good reason not to. And, um, so obviously, if you're holding library programs and meeting rooms, um, that is so closely connected to you that they have the right to preempt anything else. Um, and uh, you can also, since uh, you, know, you allow everybody to come into your library, you can require groups using your facilities to also allow anybody to attend their meetings. Now Tim's going to take off here and uh, talk a little bit about privacy and confidentiality. All right, <clears throat> thank you. Um, privacy and confidentiality, those are two separate words, so I kind of open this section by just discussing 
what both of those mean and kind of the relationship between the two. What is the difference? Privacy is about the person and their experience in the library. It's making sure that they are protected and that they are able to use library resources in comfort and without concern about somebody you know, looking over their shoulder, whether that looking over the shoulder is digital, whether it's actually somebody coming up behind me and noticing what book I'm reading, any of those things, we want to make sure that your privacy is protected uh, when you're in the library. That's uh, a direct corollary to freedom to read. I should have the freedom to read. I should also have the freedom to read whatever I want, and I should not have you nosing into my privacy, taking notes on what I'm reading. The extension of that is confidentiality. Again, related, but not exactly the same. That's the data we have on a patron. That's anything from keeping a list of books that people have checked out, which you should not do. Um, <clears throat> or it's knowing, hey, you know, this computer went to these websites, so on and so forth. So that's not necessarily something that's going to impact the user's experience, but that's going to be data that's collected on the, on the patron. And if you collect that data, you either have to be very, very careful about keeping it confidential, or as I'll talk about in a little more detail, the best thing you can do is to whatever extent possible, simply do not collect data on your patrons. The best way to maintain that confidentiality is just to never have the data there to be with. So those two concepts really are related, and they do have some ethical and legal considerations Obviously, as librarians, um, privacy is embedded in the right to read. I touched on that in, in the previous comment. But what that means for you is I can't read what I want to read if Mike is looking over my shoulder and saying, you know, quit reading, um, you know, this Buddhist fiction. I'm, I'm offended by that. Or, you know, quit researching. Um, you know, that particular medical condition, I'm, I'm offended by that. I no longer have the right to read in a full form if my privacy is being um, compromised or, or violated or kind of whittled away. Now, the other thing that I think librarians need to keep in mind, and, and we really built this whole manual with the idea of making sure that you are all well prepared for this. Uh, there are legal protections at both the state and federal levels. That's been touched on a little bit earlier throughout the presentation. The point that I want to highlight about that, um, that means that if you mess up somebody's privacy, you could put yourself in your institution on the hook. And that is something, yeah, obviously, I mean, I think all of us know, that's something you do not want to do. It's going to be bad for you, it's going to be bad for the institution, it's going to be bad for the community. So, when, when you're talking about that, that legal grounding is something that you need to be aware of to protect yourself, to make sure that you're doing things right, to make sure that, that you're providing what the patrons need, and also that you're keeping your institution running well. And I'll talk a little bit more about how and when you kind of want to mention the legal protections as well as the ethical protections. As far as practical considerations, the key concepts you're looking at here is, and again, I'm just going to kind of read this whole quote, libraries should minimize the collection of personally identifiable user information, they should store it only locally and securely, and they should maintain legal control of the data and ensure the library practices do not divulge user information or put it on public view. For example, um, self-service hold shelves that reveal a user's identity, you go up, it's terribly convenient, you go up, you grab the book, call in and it's waiting for you on the shelf. Well, the concern that you have there, and somebody else can come by and say, oh, well, Mike appears to be reading up on this particular medical condition. Gosh, I wonder if his insurance agent knows about this. You know, there's, there's a health concern there that's not being told. So there are some major concerns along with things like that. And, and it is really partly in how you structure your library and how you design some of your practices in, in your library. There are ongoing concerns that you want to be aware of, and these are just some that I kind of wanted to highlight uh, for this presentation. First, you do have community norms. Um, one of the things that you're talking about there, again, kind of adjacent to some of the things that Todd mentioned, is say that you have a, a young person who is reading books and 
their parent wants to know what is so and so reading, what is so and so reading, how are they doing, so on and so forth. And that's going to be kind of a community norm. And you might have said, oh, well, so and so is reading Peter Rabbit. And later on, oh, well, so, so and so is reading Beverly Cleary. And all of a sudden, somebody is 12 or 13, and oh, well, so and so is reading about a religion that's not in your household. Oh, well, so, so and so is reading books about uh, LGBT books. And all of a sudden, you know, you've kind of established what was an innocent practice. You're just keeping the parents aware of what their kids are reading. And you build that practice, you build that norm, and all of a sudden you are radically invading that young person's privacy. And you never set out to get there. And then you have a real sticky wicket. The parent comes in and says, well, you always told me what my child been reading from the time they were five to seven to elementary school. Now all of a sudden at 14, 15, you're cutting me off. So it's, it's a little bit tricky, but what you want to do in those situations is set up a benchmark early. You want to be very early at age three, age four, age five, talking about, hey, talk to your kid about what they're checking out. And, and you don't have to couch it as this is raw privacy, et cetera, et cetera. You can say, you know what, I think they have been checking some books out. Have a conversation with them. I think they've got some interesting stuff. See what they're willing to tell you about it. Encourage the parent to have the conversation rather than getting yourself in the middle of something that, that can ultimately become very dangerous, both ethically and legally. Another ongoing concern that we all want to be aware of is law enforcement. Law enforcement will come in, they'll want to know, hey, was so-and-so in the library? Hey, did so-and-so read such-and-such -such book, et cetera, et cetera? And again, you want to have a good relationship with law enforcement, so there's a component of education that needs to take place there. Again, you do want to make sure that any data that you keep, that you do provide it to the necessary authorities as required under law. If they do come in with a subpoena, you do have to give them the information that you have. So on the back end, you want to make sure that you have very little information just to keep yourself from getting entangled. And on the front end, if they come in and ask for information without a subpoena, you want to remind law enforcement that they could actually break their own case. If they come in and they get information from you and they go to build their case based on information that they got from you, but they didn't go through the proper legal channels to get that information, they're going to get into court and the, the defendant's attorney is going to say, listen, you didn't get a subpoena from the library. You have to throw this whole section of your case out. And again, you want to build that relationship ahead of time so that you have room to do that education. But then if officers of the law come in, you're in a really strong position to say, you know what, we're always going to work with, with a subpoena. I'm sorry, officer, I can't give you that information right now. Talk to your folks, come back with the necessary legal documents. We're absolutely willing to provide what we're required to provide. Mm -hmm. For both of our purposes, though, we need to make sure that we do that correctly. It needs to be a win win on both sides. Yes, yeah. yes. And when you frame and it that you, way. Yeah, convince them that this is bad for you. Right. You just do this. You want to do it. Yeah. We're not. Remind them they want to do it the right way. <laughs> we're not, yeah, we're not adversarial on it. It's something that, hey, you want to do this the right way. I want to do this the right way. The worst thing that could happen is they do things the wrong way, we comply with it, and all of a sudden that case is blown. And somebody who was probably going to be convicted of some bad activity has back on the library and the library has been involved in ruining the case. Yep, yep. Mm -hmm. The last one that I want to touch on, this is really interesting and you could go on at length, so I'm not going through today. Um, we are increasingly partnering with vendors for a lot of the services we provide. Libraries have a strong ethical and legal commitment to privacy and confidentiality. Vendors do not always know or share those same values. And in fact, there are some situations, again, without going into detail, it turned out that Harvard University was leaking information about their patrons to Amazon because they were using Amazon's images. So you're looking through the catalog and you want to see what a book looks like. You want to see what the cover looks like. Well, Harvard had been getting those images from Amazon and Amazon then, just a standard practice for Amazon, was loading some cookies in. Some of those cookies apparently collected personally identifying information, which is a huge no-no. That's something you want to stay away from. So it's not just us. 
we need to build out the technology and we need to build out awareness with our vendors and partners so that they are also abiding by those same practices. That's one that I could go on at length, and again, as I said, I'm not going to today. Um, turning to the next section that I'm going to cover, uh, policies. Really, this is going to kind of summarize everything that's gone before. All the stuff we've talked about up to this point are things that you want to have policies about. So this is just an overview of, of what policies should be and how you want to go about creating those policies. This picture right here, this is actually my worst nightmare. Uh, I have an ongoing anxiety dream, and it's about three weeks into the semester, and there's a class that I have not been to, and I finally found the class, and I am due to give a presentation, and I am not prepared. I don't know what the presentation is about. I didn't really know where the class was, and all of a sudden I'm in a situation where I am facing a real challenge, and I'm not prepared. So the analogy that I draw there, and the reason I put this particular slide in, is if you don't have policies and something blows up in your library, it is going to be your worst nightmare. But if you do have policies, unlike myself in this dream, <laughs> you're going to be the student who's welcome. You're going to be the student who's done their homework, who's ready for class, who's been going all along. And so when a challenge arises, you're going to be empowered and confident to deal with that challenge. And policy is absolutely the way to do that. Think of what your worst nightmare would be and write the policy about it. <laughs> yeah, that's that's a great way to put that. Exactly. Think of what your worst nightmare would be and then check your policies and see if you have something about that. Why are policies important? You know, sort of philosophically or conceptually, they promote equitable and principled access to libraries. More practically, they protect and empower you and your staff. So again, when a situation arises, you're prepared for it, you're empowered, your staff is empowered and ready to deal with the situation. Just as a brief overview, some of the things we've talked about, you want to make sure you have a policy around collection development because people are going to challenge that. Why did you get this particular book? Why did you not get that particular book? They're going to challenge you on privacy, both for and against. They're going to say, why don't I have access to this? Why won't you tell me? Again, why won't you tell me what my child's reading? Uh, you're going to have policy, you're going to want to have policies around the internet. Obviously, I think all of us know you want to have policies around expected behavior in the libraries. If somebody's acting up, we all know what acting up is in the library. But if you don't have a policy that prohibits a particular kind of acting up, if you throw somebody out for really frankly bad behavior, but there's no policy against it, you're exposing yourself to legal challenges. You're exposing yourself to lots of concerns. Um, again, I'm not going to go into a lot of details. I gave us great information about meeting rooms, but you do want to have clear policies set up. Just briefly touching back on what was mentioned there, when you have a meeting room, you have to set up your policies carefully. If you allow uh, an author to collect a certain amount for signed books, and then you're allowing an author to collect in a meeting room, you want to think about whether you're going to allow a religious organization to collect in those rooms. And so when you build those policies, just think about all the implications that are there. And again, you do want to build policies around labeling and or rating uh, any of the material that you have there. How to develop good policy? How do you do it? How does it happen? Um, this is absolutely advertising, but uh, if, uh, if Michael, we have our uh, <laughs> journal around, get this handbook. Um, Yes, it's self-advertising, but you can get it for free online. Uh, and we wrote it for you. This is, this is designed to be a quick primer, a handbook. It's not a substitute for legal counsel or anything like that. ALA also has excellent resources. I believe we have a ton of those resources connected to this presentation. Once you've started drafting your policy, involve your stakeholders. Make sure your uh, library board is on board. Talk to people in city government. If your library has legal counsel itself, be talking to them. If city government has legal counsel, be talking to them as well. As you're developing it, and once you have it developed, then uh, make sure you're sharing it and discussing it with your staff so that your staff know what is in it, and they know how to defend it as well, and they know how to protect themselves and the institution in any sort of um, challenging situations. Make it readily available, not just to your staff, but make it readily available to everybody. If they come in and they want to know what the policies are, 
let them know. Make that uh, something that the community is aware of. And then most importantly, use it and adhere to it. If, if you have a policy that's not enforced or enforced irregularly, essentially you don't even have a policy at some point anyway. So, and that's, um, that's very important because, for example, often convenient policy and other policies, if something does go to court on you, the court is going to look not only at the policy, but whether you have applied it consistently. Yeah. That, and that's that's across the board. I mean, if you're if you're if you have great policies, but you're letting them bend for your buddy who wants to do a sales presentation, or you're letting them bend for a religious organization that you're affiliated with. You're you're exposing yourself to some huge red flags there. So, and with that, that kind of wraps up my point. I'm going to shift it back to Mike, who's going to wrap it up and take us away. Yeah. Oh, thanks. Yeah. So, um, so this is just kind of where to get help and become involved because we love we love become involved. So, some national resources. I talked about the ALA Office for Intellectual Freedom. Um, that's where Jamie Larue and Christopher Call work, uh, and they're intellectual freedom giants. They do great things. Jamie LaRue spoke last year at the NLA conference. He's great. Um, and they send out kind of, uh, um, kind of a newsletter. It comes out and it talks about challenges across the country. It talks about just different interesting things that, on this topic. And here's some other ones also. They're all in the, the handbook, so we hope you download it so I don't just read through this. But um, you know, banned books, we coalition, all these different places. Some Nebraska resources. We have the Intellectual Freedom Roundtable, which is um, I mean, more than us, but we're part of it. Uh, and kind of the Nebraska Library Commission is on there, um, ACLU of Nebraska, different places. Um, and so, and this is something that was actually just signed um, in March of 2017. I just kind of want to talk about it because it's so important to just kind of how, uh, uh, how much disinformation is out there and untrue information. So NLA actually supported a resolution in support of the ALA's resolution on access to accurate information. And it's, um, you know, and it really does talk about the fact that uh, libraries really could do more and help patrons and just citizens understand what accurate information is because it's such a problem in today's society. Um, so, and, and it's kind of, uh, goes back to that quote, we do have the power to kind of disseminate information that we see fit, that we order, that we uh, that we give access to. So we really have a responsibility to make sure that we're not giving bad information to our patrons, and and we have to do it without censorship. And that's where the real divide is, right? We don't want to uh, censor anything. We also, you know, when uh, um, we also don't want to have people look at bad information and think that that's true. So. I think that's kind of thing. So the importance of intellectual freedom, you know, it's very complicated and difficult. Uh, there are two sides, and um, you know, we we always err on the side of free speech and access to information um, as long as it's legal, and you you know, kind of go by what the courts have determined is legal. Um, but it's it's an ongoing process, and it is more relevant than ever. I think in this post-truth world, um, and it's it's. You know, things that we're seeing daily uh, uh, in the news and the protesters in Berkeley, on uh, uh, conservative speakers and shutting them down, um, you know, team mascots that are offensive. These are all uh, freedom of speech, but also they are offensive to people. So it so makes it very difficult. Um, and just hurtful views you hear all the time that, do, you know, we defend the right to say those hurtful views as long as they're uh, safe and we, we don't have to like them in any way, shape, or form, but that's kind of why we live in this society. Um, so, and that, that's kind of the thing. We don't want to be just another kind of search engine, right? Um, so we think about how we should approach this fake news and misinformation and just the volume of information resources, and that's the problem. There's a lot of times Google, as everyone knows, is kind of a search engine and whatever's most popular will go to the top, and a lot of times they can have bots that just make things, uh, you know, will, will Increase the search on that. Most popular you know, is not most accurate. Yes, it's, it's not, not the same thing. It's very <laughs> often not the most accurate yeah. because they, they definitely yeah like to promote that. So we're kind of talking about what librarians can do more to help. I think, and um, it's not censorship. It's just information literacy skills, and I think that's where we really have a lot of power to do that. Um, and it's so that we're not another search engine. We're not just throwing information at people and telling them to sort it out themselves because. Uh, 
you know, people need the skills to evaluate different sources, and we are kind of that's kind of in our profession, and we're equipped to teach patients how to do find better and more useful information. So whether that's classes at public libraries, you know, we do uh, at academic libraries. I mean, they they do take how to search, how to do fit. It's kind of one class sometimes in college, and I think it really needs to be embedded in, in school libraries and, and make sure that a lot of people is reaching a lot of people. Because it's becoming, it's not going to get better, I don't believe, as time goes on <laughs> with the news. And so I kind of also want to talk about just the future of the Nebraska Information Freedom Team. Um, you know, and a lot of uh, where we're trying to go, you know, surveys report up to 85% of challenges go unreported in the country by the Office of Intellectual Freedom. And so what we're trying to work on is kind of an annual survey to capture more of that challenge material throughout Nebraska. Um, and it, it's, you know, just making sure that maybe a library director gets a challenge or has a book stolen, that it never gets reported anywhere because they just replace it or something like that. But we're kind of a team that want to hear about that and want to keep track of that because if we see trends, if we see different, um, you know, uh, different groups that are getting targeted, that's something that I think uh, the to be able to respond to it, yeah. Mm -hmm. Be able to respond and know where it's coming from. I was surprised by that, that so much of it is unreported, but I, and I don't, is it because they don't want to let people know it's happening, or they just deal with it and it's just part of the regular day, unfortunately, and they just, they dealt with the person who had the issue and maybe took care of it. Yeah. I mean, and they don't feel the need to let everyone, someone know, mm -hmm. or do they not know there's a place they should be reporting? Like keep tracking your statistics of how many times someone confronts you or questions what, why you take their book in the library, why did you, you know. Yeah, well I think some of it sometimes is not even realizing that there is a place that you can report it yeah. to. Yeah. And um, the Office for Intellectual Freedom has recently simplified its form and made it easier to report mm -hmm. these things. And we're trying to, Michael especially has been, you know, creating that uh, survey so that we hopefully can in the future capture that information much better that you know people will have an easily available place to go. I think that was part of it. the infrastructure really hasn't been there. Yeah. Who do I tell? Do I yeah. tell anybody? Yeah. yeah. And, that, and that study was based on uh, you know they surveyed states that tried to find the Office of Intellectual Freedom and they found out that I think in, in Texas three percent actually reported the Office of Intellectual Freedom. So it's where they're not getting any of this information. Mm -hmm. And and really if you if, if you go even farther, I mean some of the states that were surveyed, I'm sure even less of that gets reported. I mean a, a book that was hidden for a while and they find it, they might just put it back on the shelf and, and never talk about it. They don't realize that that's what that was all about. Mm -hmm. It wasn't just misshelved or put somewhere the accident. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's that's the other thing ALA is starting to uh, um, include hate crimes in libraries. Mm -hmm. And so they and I know uh, the thing I just read, and it was from last year, there were, um, or maybe early this year, there was, uh, they already had seven reports of hate crimes in libraries. Mm -hmm. so, so they're trying to also keep track of that as well as part of the, their new survey and reports. That might be something we also just ask about as a question mm -hmm. in our survey. So, um, yeah, as far as, as far as that goes, there might be. Does anyone else have, do you have any questions or anyone? No, Great. Yes, if anybody has, you know, have any questions um, that you want to ask, go ahead and take it in. Um, if you have any situations maybe that you've been in and you're not sure, what should I do in this situation or think you're thinking of, I can ask advice right now while we're here. Um, I will say it's a little after 11 o'clock and officially the show goes 10 to 11 a.m., but we don't cut off. That's okay. <laughs> um, we don't get cut off of the software or anything either. Um, if people have questions, comments, anything they want to say, um, we'll go as long as you guys are asking them. Um, Something I do have is a question about, <clears throat> and I think we'll go maybe and show it. Um, we want to know what the URL is actually to the handbook. Oh, and um, if um, you want to, you can um, you can go to that here on the computer. Yeah, you can just show it. Yeah, so hit escape and it'll pop you out of this little screen. Actually, I looked it up here. Okay, that'd be great. I can't remember where it's at. Well, I think it's Google it. Yeah, I think it's Google it. There it is. I'm not doing Google. You're doing the mouse. Use that to move around a little better. <laughs> um, so, it's a URL somewhere. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it is, but um, 
It's digitalcommons.us, or if you want to Google it, show them how to get to it. I just Googled the commons. I think I might be too far away from the computer because I can't tell you. Um, okay. Let's see here. Actually, this is your just in your presentations. Presentation. Oh, yeah. There I'm we go. To yeah. 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 But I think you can do it simply Google it. Yeah, that's like Nebraska and Georgia. There we go. Well, that's uh, that's about that's about that's about that's about that's about that. Oh, come on. Well, we're going to be on that. There we go. Okay. There, is, there is that first link, yeah. 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 Evan J. Elsner. Oh, yes, good. your name is first there. <laughs> yeah. Out of the, the friend. So, this is the page that you land on um, when you follow, follow that Google link. And you can see there that you can buy the book and you'll get a print edition. It takes some, just a little bit to actually print it out and send it to you. But it, you can also download it here and that will be a free download. It will be a PDF. Um, and, but uh, then you print out yourself if you want to. Yeah. If you and up there, there's the editors and authors manual are listed. So, yeah, there it is on the digital commons. My consumed it all the hard work. <laughs> <laughs> they did the editing, which, um, yeah, I think there was a lot of work involved in that. <laughs> so, great job. Um, and then the, the, um, the ALA um, Office Intellectual Freedom Forum for Reporting Things, do you? Oh, we could find that. Do you have that? Or is that in the book? Is it in there somewhere? Mm -hmm. Or um, I, I believe they have our resources. Yeah, the uh, uh, Office right. for Intellectual Freedom. Yeah. Is. There's a sample request for reconsideration. Let's see, I don't know if that one is. <clears throat> I don't think the actual. And we'll include all these links afterwards in the recording notes as well, so you'll have direct links to them as well if you're not catching them all as we're showing them here. Yeah, um, challenge reporting. Challenge right. reporting. Um, so this is what it looks like. So what are you reporting material? And, and there's a we based ours on this also, so it's pretty similar to this when we send it out. Um, now there's just like there any time you can build a reporter. Is yours going to be somewhere like on the I have website or how are you doing your you said an email survey well, email. We are not hoping to do because people don't really go to it as much for traffic. So we're right. hoping to send it through the library system is probably okay. we can send it to um, schools. I mean I guess we kind of we haven't really had a meeting for a while. <laughs> okay. But um you know send it to maybe schools because schools well, do probably yeah. a lot of challenges okay. here. They go and report it. Um, and just because I I'm sure there's and you know, I actually called down to see to the commission to see, and there there really isn't a system in Nebraska that that puts those all together. And I found a site, um, Oregon Intellectual Freedom. They have kind of a clearinghouse, and they do this every year. Mm -hmm. I'm kind of basing it on what they've been doing for years. And every year they've done it since like 1990. We'll show if there's more or less, and what the trends are. And, mm -hmm. Cool. Yeah. It's, and theirs is a little more because this is their simplified one. I think they base it on the old one, so I do have some extra kind of why because this doesn't really have. And they recently did simplified. Yeah. Oh, just why did the initiative say this is a concern? Because the original one has like a Dropbox of different choices. Kind of oh, different this one is just free text. Mm -hmm. Type in whatever happened. Yeah. Tell us whatever happened. Yeah. Which that could look too. Yeah. Tell us in your own words. Yeah. So yeah, if you do have a challenge, though, they they do want to hear, and I think giving it to ALA is is really important. Oh, that's why yeah. they're collecting nationally, just nationally, not across the country. Yeah, and I like they have a description too. So I was wondering too on what are you reporting it of what um, is considered a hate crime? Oh, it had a little because I was wondering. Well, hate crimes, defacement. Oh wait, right oh. there. And the um, oh, hate crime, defacement, defacement of library property. property. Yeah. To target a specific group. So so if you're not sure, because I know sometimes where that's something that oftentimes in cases is both well, is it a hate crime or not. Mm -hmm. This list gives you an idea of the kind of things that they're talking about. Yeah. That you could maybe be aware of. 
Right. This is true. The Tron goes missing. And I think they did talk about that. It, it being, um, I think in one library it was um, defaced and they, they considered that to be a hate crime. Yeah. Okay. So nobody's typed in any urgent questions they desperately need an answer right That's now. Urgent. Except, <laughs> except we want to know where to get a hold of the email, yeah. which is good. That it right. us. Then we want to know that because that's kind of the whole point of this, yes. Um, so I think since, um, yeah, nobody really needs anything right now, we can wrap it up. Um, you guys can always contact them. To, um, where's your contact information on that? Social Freedom website um, or through? You can contact the, us through NLA, um, through the NLA Intellectual Freedom Roundtable. Mm -hmm. you, you can contact myself. <laughs> I'm um, you know, the office, which are actually listed. The yeah, they're listed, 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 listed on the NLA website, yeah. Along the contact. And their direct emails, yeah. Because yeah. the email addresses would be to their um, work emails, most likely. Yeah. yeah. Their efforts you guys all have up there, yeah. So Google, we'll look them up. We'll be able to ask any questions when you want. So, um, yeah, I think we'll wrap it up. Jay, okay. thank you. Um, thank you, everyone, for attending. Yeah, thank, thank you. you guys it's for very no, that's fine. Yeah. Um, this is a very important topic, and I'm glad we had you guys on. Um, as I told them, I didn't tell you guys. I attended the session earlier in the year at a press as at one of our um, meetings, and it's been, they've been presenting all over the place. I don't know if you're doing it also at NLA and SLA yeah. conference. So it's going to be a, uh, twice. I think we're extending it and doing more. Yeah, so more in depth. More. Yeah, that's good. So definitely, if you have more questions and things, come to the conference out in Kearney in October to, to talk um, directly. Um, but I, you know, it's very important. A lot of issues are things that people are having so much trouble with. Always have over the years, and unfortunately, I think it's getting even worse. So um, I'm glad you guys. I'm glad Ailey updated theirs. I'm glad you guys updated yours as well for Nebraska. So please do go out there and take a look at it. Um, so that'll wrap it up for today's show. It has been recorded and will be posted onto our website um, maybe later today, maybe tomorrow, depending on how quickly I get to it. Um, can we just take in there and cut the slides? And I'll show you on our website where all this is. Um, as I said, it gets updated to you, up, upload. Right. <laughs> <laughs> there it is, the first one right there. Oh, no, mouse. Oh, the. And so far, nothing else on the internet is called Encompass Live. So um, you can come to you when you Google it. We are the first result. Yeah, go ahead and click on that. Um, all of our recordings are posted to YouTube, so it depends on how how they cooperate with my trying to upload things and getting up there. Um, um, these are our upcoming sessions, but right beneath them is our archives. And our most recent ones are right at the top. This is last week's um, session. The recording will be here. Um, um, send me a link to the presentation, um, whatever the uh, public link to the Google file, we'll get that going. And then um, any links that were mentioned to the websites will list here as well, a direct link to the hand, um, handbook, um, the link to the NL, um, intellectual freedom um, webpage within the NLA website, because sometimes those are hard to drill down into. Um, we'll get that all up for you. Um, for anyone who attended today or registered, I will email you when it's ready. So um, I'll look for that email. Um, and like I said, today, maybe tomorrow, depending on how quickly things go. <laughs> um, I hope you join us next week when our topic is a whole bunch of med, <laughs> PubMed, PubMed Central, Medline, Medline Plus. What are all of these things? There's so many different medical things you can, and what? Um, <laughs> and then, um, Mas from, uh, she is, well, she's a couple of different things. It's kind of, she's, um, National Network Libraries of Medicine. Um, she is the librarian related to that group, um, out working out of Creighton University, um, and she's going to come over here and talk to us about what all these are, um, what the difference is, why I would use certain ones for certain things, and I'd like to know too because I'm. I, mean, I definitely do look for things that are from Medline when I'm online, but is it the best one? We were talking about medical research, so so check in with us, and Annette will tell us what tech that's all about <laughs> next week. And all of our other topics for the um, in July are posted here. I'm working on sessions for August and, of course, future ones, so keep an eye on our schedule, and they'll be added here as we are um, um, confirm them. Also, Encompass Live is on Facebook, so if you're a big Facebook user, please do pop over there and give us a like. 
Um, this will probably have a little pop up that says join Facebook. No. Um, but here's our page, and you have a close reminders of when the show is starting up. This is a reminder for today's show. When our recordings are available, I post on here. It was not from last week. Um, so if you're already on Facebook, um, like and come us over there, and you'll get reminders about what we're doing here. Other than that, that wraps up the week. Thank you very much for being here. Thank you. For and having thank us. you all for attending. See you next time on Encompass Live. Bye-bye. Bye, all. -bye. Bye -bye.